Hello, friends, and welcome to Zionville, ripe for life. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we begin. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for this opportunity to gather together once more. Today we have a simple message. Please be with me as I give it and be with all of us as we enact it out in our lives. We thank you and glorify you, and we pray for the salvation of souls through our efforts together. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Ripe for life. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. What a promise this is, and yet how many really understand its depth of meaning? How many of us use it wrongly? Let's have a look. Confession time. For years, I used this verse wrongly. Back in my pre-Adventist Calvinistic days, I used it like I would use a bar of soap every day in the shower. I would sin, willingly even, planning to do so at times, and then assuage my conscience by afterwards confessing that newly committed sin to receive forgiveness. Over and over again, I did this. I was deceived into thinking that this is what the verse meant, a carte blanche to act however I wanted and still be saved in the end because God would always forgive me, right? Again, what deception. I did this for years. Sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. Hey, doesn't it say that if we confess our sins, he'll forgive us? It does, but you cannot leave off the second clause as I was wrongly doing. That clause reads, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is where the depth of meaning comes in. You see, friends, God's purpose in salvation is not only to forgive us, justification, but also to make us whole again, sanctification, holiness, the way Adam was before he fell into sin, Genesis 3. To do that, God not only forgives, as John says here, but he cleanses too. That's the point. He intends to have a holy people on earth when Jesus returns, Luke 18, verse 8, clause B, a pure people who would rather die than commit a known sin, Revelation 12, 11. This is not just a nice option if we really want to go to heaven. It is an absolute necessity. It is salvation. We must repent and be obedient. Here again is his purpose in saving us that he might sanctify and cleanse it, his people, the church, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. That starts here, now, on earth. We must get serious about Jesus and get with him, you and I, for he is our all in all and the only one who can bring this to pass in our characters. No more games, no more playing church. This means that real Christians will avoid sin like the plague and learn how, by God's powerful grace, to resist all temptation. Bit by bit, this is, a, this is growth in grace, true sanctification. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing how ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Second Peter three seventeen and 18. And the messenger of the remnant put it as clearly as it can be put in plain English. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. Manuscript 161, 1897, as found also in the third volume of Selected Messages, page 360, paragraph 4. If you have not this faith, you will never step forward in faith to overcome sin, believing it is not possible nor necessary. Oh, but it is. As the beloved disciple John tells us, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, but whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. 1 John chapter 3, verses 6-8, to 8, clause A. 
We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. 1 John 5, 18. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, verse 4. Does that sound impossible? Only if you do not believe the promises that we've just looked at on this slide, along with all the other promises and facts in the scriptures to this effect. Here are but a very few of them. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25 we can't do it of ourselves, but Christ working for us and in us can give us the power we need to do it to the uttermost and always, for he ever liveth for us to make intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. He is our great high priest. To him we must flee. So get rid of those false teachings you have been drinking in that you cannot cease from sin or that God doesn't require it anyway. These are lies from Satan. Trust God's word instead. Repent, change, and grow into Christ's image. And the result, if we really believe and act on God's promises that we have been surveying, is this. Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. We will always triumph. We'll stumble at times, yes, particularly at the beginning. But as time goes on, we will more and more put sin away and have the victory. It will be the new normal and habitual thing. Eventually, we will be ready for translation at the second coming or a peaceful death, truly in Christ, whichever happens first. Let us set our faces as flint, therefore, and move ever forward, eschewing all evil and sidetracks. Let us remember whether we sleep or abide, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we sh he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3 and verse 2. Compare this with 1 John 3 verse 6, which we just read, which says that sinners have not seen him. What we see all the more increasingly is pure holiness in the Son of God, and thus we are changed by viewing that image of him from faith to faith, from glory to glory. This is the real Christian growth of pure sanctification, not the weird gyrations of holy rollers. Awake from sleep, my friends. Hallelujah. We all know many people who don't much care about God, Christ, the Bible, or spiritual things. I used to be that way, deeply so. They tell us they don't really believe any of it, but many inside really want to overcome their faults and sins. They just don't know how. And we know that the only lasting way to do that is by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of our lives, as we have been discussing, in spirit and in truth, not merely as mental constructs. They really need Jesus moment by moment in their lives, as everyone does, and as we have found out for ourselves. Let us all help them across the finish line, my friends. So please pray for all those you can who are very close to, the ma to making the most important transaction of their lives, to choose Jesus and be born again of the Spirit of Christ. Many are not quite there yet, but if they respond, you'll meet them in heaven, and you will have had a part in it. That will be wonderful. And pray, too, for their earthly needs in the meantime as well. Help them where you can. Things are not getting any easier for any of us in this sin-cursed world the closer it comes to being fully unbound into the glorious liberty of the children of God, Romans 8.21, by Christ at his coming. And may all the glory go to God and to Christ for all their doings towards us. Wonderful benevolence. And remember this, friends. Jesus is coming soon. No doubt about it. Maranatha.